Can COVID make a comeback? China is still cautious with its zero COVID policy expected to persist until spring. But with months of no restrictions in most of the world, should we declare the pandemic over? Or is a winter of pain still to come? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is COVID-19. U.S. President Joe Biden caused some unease when he announced on national television that the COVID-19 pandemic was over. Public health experts had never made that declaration, and they made it clear it wasn't time to. Yes, the virus may be under control, but on average, it's killing some 400 Americans a day. Now, that's not to say the opposite end of the spectrum isn't without controversy. China's zero COVID policy has come in for plenty of criticism. Not least when people were told not to flee their buildings after a deadly earthquake struck a lockdown Sichuan province. So the question now is just how serious a threat COVID is today and where does the best public health policy lie? That debate in just a moment. But first, this report. The refrain of the pandemic has been that no one is safe until everyone is safe. Currently, the number of people around the world who are unvaccinated for COVID-19 is in the billions. And while the virus kills hundreds, sometimes thousands every day, U.S. President Joe Biden declared an end to the pandemic. The pandemic is over. We still have a problem with COVID. We're still doing a lot of work on it. Uh, it's But the pandemic is over. Healthcare experts criticize Biden's assessment as premature, and they have the numbers to back it up. According to the World Health Organization, 75% of the population in high-income nations have been vaccinated, while in low-income countries, the vaccination rate is only 19%, and that number can be much lower. For instance, 8% in Mali and only 3% in Congo. This deadly disparity is also not limited to vaccines, as coronavirus tests and life-saving antiviral drugs are not equally available around the globe. Speaking at last week's UN General Assembly, the Director General of the WHO warned that when one country falls behind in combating the virus, we all do. These inequities are not just a risk for those they affect directly. They are a risk for all of us. So closing them is essential if we are truly, if we are to truly end the pandemic. So if low-income countries can't get vaccinations and tests, why don't they just make them? The big obstacle is patent rights. For 20 months, South Africa and India have fought with the UK, US and Switzerland for an intellectual property waiver. In June, the World Trade Organization approved a partial waiver for vaccines, but it excludes the tests and treatments. The co-chair of the People's Vaccine Alliance, Max Lawson, said it is disgraceful that rich countries have prevented the WTO from delivering a meaningful agreement on vaccines and have dodged the responsibility to take action on treatments while people die without them. So while U.S. President Biden may have declared the COVID-19 pandemic over, it could be assumed he wasn't speaking for everyone. So how much danger may we be in? and whose public policy reflects the best approach. Joining me now to debate that and more from Geneva is Dr. Margaret Harris. She is a clinical epidemiologist and a spokesperson for the World Health Organization. Dr. Amish Adalja joins us from White House Station, New Jersey. He's a senior scholar at Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. And from Lyon, France, Edward Kelly. He helped lead the WHO's COVID-19 response as director of Integrated Health Services. And now he's the global health lead for Apiject. Thanks all so much for being with us. Ed, I'll start with you because you've always been impressed with, with how quickly the world, you know, especially the West, was able to mobilize uh, in response to this pandemic. But vaccines were developed quickly and they were distributed quickly as well. 
But are we backsliding at this point? I think unquestionably we are. I mean, if you look at the uh, deaths that have occurred uh, in recent days, since sort of mid-July, we're dealing with uh, somewhere around 2,000 deaths a day globally. So even just in the last number of weeks, we've got 100,000, over 100,000 deaths. So clearly we are not uh, out of the woods yet. In France, where uh, I live, there's fears about an eighth wave, there's rising hospitalizations in some countries in, in Europe. So it's clear there's uh, a worry. At the same time, we've got waning immunity mm. for adults. Uh, we've got perhaps uh, less energy in our immunization programs. And a lot of countries have run up short in terms of procuring money to uh, buy the next round of doses and prepare for the winter. So yes, in short, uh, there should be some concern for us. Okay, Dr. Amos Shadalja, are you on the same page there? I mean, what do you think, if so, what do you think has, has gone wrong? I think that what we have to recognize is that this is a virus that can never be eradicated, that can never be eliminated. We're going to have a baseline number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. And the key thing is, is we have to use the tools that medicine and science have given us to tame this virus. And not enough people are using those tools, are using them appropriately. And if that's the case, you're going to see hospitals have increased numbers, you're going to see deaths increase. But I think we have to recognize that at this stage of the pandemic, we're at a point where we have more tools for COVID-19 than we do for any other respiratory virus. It's all about implementing those tools and recognizing that just because we're not in the acute phase of the pandemic any longer in many parts of the world, doesn't mean that you completely ignore the fact that there are there's still work to do with COVID-19. In the United States, for example, too many high-risk individuals are not boosted, not getting monoclonal antibodies, not getting antivirals. So we we still have much work to do going forward to really make this a manageable, a more manageable illness. But it is infinitely more manageable than it was just a couple of years ago. Right. But Margaret Harris, uh, will we all pay a price for the unvaccinated? I mean, we were told, as you know very well by the WHO, no one is safe until everyone is safe. But here we are with restrictions dropped hospitalizations way down and people are actually feeling safe even though billions of people are still unvaccinated. How do we reconcile that? So you raise the, the, the most critical problem that we have all collectively failed to solve. Even though we knew right from the beginning we needed to solve this, but we still haven't solved the that human instinct to grab what you can if you've got the resources to do it. By the end of 2021, we had enough vaccines to vaccinate every adult in the on the entire planet. 12 point over 12 billion vaccines were available, vaccine doses of COVID, different COVID vaccines. But 95% of adults in the poorest countries were not at that point vaccinated. Now we are catching up, but there is a real danger that indeed a lot of people seem, especially in the more resourced countries, seem to quite bizarrely, honestly, think that somehow this is, this is last year's story. I mean, we are still in the middle of a global health crisis and indeed it will come roaring back if we don't address the, the, the disparities and get everyone vaccinated mm. around the world. Uh, then having said that, I mean, how surprised were you to hear you know, US President Joe Biden actually declare the pandemic over? So I, I think he actually changed that the, that communication. Uh, so I think it's it's not really fair to be commenting on on that particular uh, on that particular comment. I think it is very important that people understand that we are still very much in the acute phase, but we do have the tools available to bring it to an end. But we're not using them fairly and equitably. Ed Kelly, let's talk a little bit more about those tools, though. And I mean, are updated vaccines getting rolled out in time? From what we're hearing, the U.S., for example, has one to fight the newest subvariants. The U.K. is using one that prevents the first Omicron strain. So are we genuinely prepared for this coming season? Well, uh, in terms like uh, the, uh, our other panelists have said, um, we can't be 100% prepared. We'll never vaccinate our way out of COVID. We just don't have the current vaccines that prevent infection. 
but I couldn't agree with with uh, Margaret more that you know we didn't do a good enough job when we had enough vaccine doses. And secondly, I'd add to that that we concentrated on vaccines and not vaccination. So I mean, I work in syringes, but so there was a syringe shortage that WHO and UNICEF warned about, but there was also underinvestment in health workers and all the things that go with that. So right now, the idea that we are going to chase this virus with uh, updated variant-specific vaccines is only based on the fact that we think we can outrun a very fast-moving uh, virus. So it's mm. quite clear that a set of vaccines that only last for about four months in terms of immunity won't be our medium to long-term solution. So we're going to have to look at some of these new vaccines that are coming online and new ways to vaccinate. Hmm. So uh, uh, help us understand that. I mean, how, how scared should we be? We don't want to be overly alarmist, but from what it sounds like from all three of you, we are not out. We're not quite prepared. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? Well, clearly, I think a lot of uh, folks who work in public health are nervous about uh, the coming winter. Uh, we have uh, a bit of a perfect storm, although every every uh, year we come back and talk to each other and we say, ah, this year is going to be the perfect storm. So we mm. keep getting more and more perfect in our storms. But the idea that we have a flu season coming, uh, that'll be a demand on the vaccination programs. We've got under, we've got low funding levels for COVID uh, pr public health programs, vaccines, and also testing. And we've got a massive problem that WHO and UNICEF have pointed out of 25 million uh, under and unvaccinated uh, children from routine vaccinations because of the pressure that's been put under. So we have a lot of uh, balls in the air and we've got to get better at, at balancing them all. We can't have a, a one public health problem uh, per, for, for the entire world to distract right. us all. There's a lot of things to get done. I mean, Dr. Dalger, you can comment on that as well. You know, we've been hearing now that we need to prepare for a flu COVID twindemic is uh, the new term we've, re we've been hearing. We, we need to prepare for that coming. Is that true? It definitely is going to be the case, though. We're not spared a flu season the way we've been spared the last couple of seasons, because what we look at is the Southern Hemisphere, and we're seeing they're having a very regular flu season or just had a regular flu season. And that means that there's going to be demands on hospitals, emergency departments for flu at the same time that likely there will be increased COVID cases as people move indoors and it gets colder. So we have to be able to have a sustainable system that can absorb both flu, both COVID and other respiratory viruses. We can't kind of focus only on one thing. As you just heard uh, from that prior panelist, vaccinations against childhood illnesses are down and we're worried about measles in certain parts of the, the world. We also have monkeypox and so, so it has to be that infectious disease emergencies are thought of as something almost like national defense and that they're funded that way sustainably, not boom or bust, not move resources from one infectious disease to fight another. We have to be able to do all of this at the same time. And in order to do that, public health has to really be funded in a whole different manner and not be something that goes through these cycles where when something sl slips from the headlines, people start ignoring it because mm. that's how problems arise. Uh, you know, winter flu virus season is coming and... Uh you can say this is this is a bizarre point to make, but it does concern some people because the Europe and U.S. people there may be colder than they've ever been before, given this energy crisis that's coming. Um, we've heard that the cold weather actually does allow the membrane of the virus to strengthen. That's why we have uh, these viral seasons. So does it worry you that there's there may be this issue compounding the problem that people might not be able to heat their homes, stay more comfortable and stay healthier than they have been in the past? We know in general, as you said, that cold temperatures favor transmission of many respiratory viruses because the virus transmits more efficiently, your immune system works less well, and then people crowd and congregate with each other when it's colder. So anything that causes those that, that alchemy to occur is going to increase transmission especially if people can't heat their homes and maybe they're going to shelters where there is heating there, that's going to create situations where respiratory viruses can abound. We've seen that when, anytime we have shelters for, for weather emergencies. So all of that's going to, to play a role. But I think the overarching point is that we have to get serious about taking respiratory viruses a, a, as a threat and really get much better at how we deal with them. I think COVID-19 should be seen as a wake-up call to what a, what a pandemic can do in the in 2020, 2021, 2022, and and we have the tools to be able to solve these problems if we actually took the threat of infectious disease 
seriously. This isn't something that governments prioritize, and we all suffer because of it. Mm, okay. Uh, Margaret Harris, the WHO can declare an end to the public health emergency of international concern. They can't declare an end to the pandemic. That is not their job, but they can make okay. that emergency declaration. Um, from what I understand, another review is actually due in a few weeks from now. Is there any indication uh, what will come of that? So, in fact, no, because it's a confidential meeting and we don't in any way influence or, or predict what that committee will do. But you're quite right. We declared the public health emergency of international concern for COVID on January 30, uh, 2020. And for every three months, the committee that provided the advice that this event constituted a public health emergency reviews that and reviews the criteria under which it was declared and advises the Director General whether or not um, the emergency continues. And um, the review is due mid-October. So it's really a case of watch this space. Oh, but what wow. they'll really look at is whether it continues to be an extraordinary event, whether there's international spread and whether we still need international cooperation. Okay. Ed, I'm coming back to you because I, I want to take a look at China quickly. Uh, you seem to know the system relatively well. I mean, they must believe their zero COVID policy is necessary because why would they choose to cripple their own economy to this extent if it, if it weren't? The question is, is it necessary only in China? Because China's health infrastructure and, and vaccination campaign hasn't quite been well enough equipped. Well, it's a great question. I'll make one quick point just on flu. Uh, for years, I directed the U.S. government's um, national health reports where we looked at disparities in delivery of key services. Flu vaccination was one of them. And actually, we weren't very good at flu vaccination. Europe isn't either. And the uh, disadvantaged groups were even worse off. And much of those disparities have remained or gotten worse. So it's something to think about as we head into the flu season. It'll once again shine the light on the ability to reach uh, uh, at-risk populations. But, you know, in China's case, actually reaching populations has not been their, their problem. They have had, uh, they were, you know, we can remember I said earlier, the outbreak's not over. China recognizes that. They were praised very early on, along with Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, other countries, Thailand, for strong zero COVID policies. Uh, but now the Omicron has really changed all that. It's, we've moved to a, a point where it's really an unwinnable game of uh, creating these massive lockdowns and testing a lot. Now, where they've created a system where they can test half a billion people in 48 hours, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. But to do that sort of locking down and testing, you're supposed to be preparing for something else. And the, the low uh, vaccination rate, particularly in the elderly, and then also less effective vaccines means they're now trapped in being really worried about an outbreak with very low immunity levels, much lower than you have in, in other countries. So uh, the question of whether this is related to other motivations by the government and how lockdowns are managed is, is probably outside the discussion, but I do think that it's having a big impact, not just on local populations where we've had uh, millions, hundreds of millions of people confined uh, in, in across 30 provinces. It's just too widespread mm. to solve it uh, with lockdowns for the moment. Amish, quickly, I mean, what are your observations of, of China? Is this kind of extreme policy getting some things right? I mean, they've also said they want long-term vaccines uh, before they let go of their zero, zero COVID policy. Is that even an option? It, it is an option, but one that's going to only come to fruition probably in a couple of years if we get universal coronavirus vaccines or ones that are more transmission blocking. What I think is happening in China is that they've now wedded themselves to a policy that has now become kind of a, a political issue, meaning that if you criticize it, you're criticizing their head of state. And it's become illegal to actually criticize, at least I've read that, the, the, the zero COVID policy there. And what they've done is they've, they've prohibited the sale of vaccines from Pfizer, from Moderna, and wanted their own mRNA vaccine, which has never come to fruition as well. It, it's just really a backwards policy that doesn't reflect the fact that this is on its way to becoming an endemic respiratory virus and a zero COVID policy that violates individual rights, that, that is draconian, uh, is not sustainable and is not the right way or the, the, the way you think about public health uh, 
uh, management. And I think it is something that needs to be called out. And I think the Chinese people need to actually demand better solutions because it's the Chinese government that's responsible for the turmoil that's in China with regard to COVID. And they should be able to do this correctly, but they've not. Hmm. Uh, Margaret, let me come to you. If you, if you have a f comments uh, to make on, on China's uh, approach, you can go ahead. If not, I wanted to ask you um, something we've, we've spoken about before, um, and people always ask this question, especially people that don't want vaccines, and that can you build up a stronger immunity if you give yourself exposure to the COVID virus? Especially in the case of Omicron, they think when they've seen the symptoms get lesser and lesser, it's better to just get it, have just that runny nose and the basic fatigue and get it out of your system, um, rather than having to get another shot that they aren't even sure if the shots are properly adjusted yet. What do you say to that approach that we can build some immunity by getting exposure to, especially Omicron? So unfortunately, we haven't seen that phenomenon. And that was certainly something that people in the early days, when some governments were even thinking that that would be their approach to just simply let the, the virus run through the community. And that fortunately, those who were thinking of taking that approach decided not to. Uh, but uh, we have not seen that natural immunity is giving you that protection. And the other thing I would say to anybody who's, no, I don't think I'll have a va vaccine. Uh, the one thing I'd say to them is long COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing millions and millions of people who are suffering. And, and it's, it, it's been a life changer and not a life changer in a good way. Uh, the um, people are finding they're exhausted. They, they've lost their their mental capacity in some cases. You know, people really can't remember things. They struggle with work. They um, and have other kinds of organic damage. We're learning much more about that. And uh, I am seeing that there's a, a larger and larger body of research, but we don't know nearly enough. So do not go out there and deliberately get COVID, please. Right. I, it still remains to be seen as well, you know, if the, the long COVID issue will actually affect our own productivity. If, if it, it does go on and get worse with more exposure to this virus and new variants that we might not, the vaccines might not protect us against, I cringe to think of what, uh, what, could, what could happen to overall general health among uh, the general and healthy population. Ed, let me come back to you because speaking of cringing, I mean, I know public health experts cringe when they, when they hear things like, oh, you know, Omicron and COVID now, it's, it's just like the flu. Uh, but tell us, I mean, is it? And how much will this Omicron and these newer, lesser strength variants actually match the annual death rate of a bad flu season? Yeah, great point. And I couldn't agree with uh, Amesh and Margaret more that um, you've got two threats from our current round of uh, COVID variants that are more infectious. One, they're causing more infection, so we're likely to get more uh, infectious variants. So Omicron has bred now Omicron 2.7, 5.2, which may be more infectious. But even if it's sort of half as severe, given that it causes, in some cases, you know, 10 and 20 times the number of cases, you're going to end up with many people in the hospital and many more deaths. And people forget last, we're about at the same point as we were last September in terms of cases. And last winter, we had health services all over the place overwhelmed. Uh, with the number of people in there. So that's, I think, one concern. And I couldn't agree more uh, about the question of long COVID. There's more recent uh, evidence that points that even mild infections can lead to long COVID symptoms. There's evidence that it causes uh, alterations in actually the sort of shape and, and function of the brain. So it's a uh, concern to, to get it. Um, we sh you know, it's too infectious. You can't live your life in fear. The, we just talked about zero COVID. But there are many, many easy things to do to prevent uh, getting sick, and we're going to be heading into a season where we need to do more prevention. Yeah. Uh, speaking of prevention, I mean, it, it's really scary now to think, even if the symptoms of Omicron are immediate Omicron are supposedly lesser, uh, to know that chronic fatigue syndrome is now being recognized as something very serious in the United States because of long COVID. And we talk about prevention going forward. I'm a Shadalja. I mean, should we at the very least be expecting mask mandates to come back into play for the winter? I don't think in the United States we're going to see government mask mandates. I think there may be recommendations, as the CDC has, when levels are high in a given community. 
to wear masks in indoor congregated settings, but I don't think we'll see the return of these uh, in, in the United States. It's a very political uh, argument. And I always think in general, public health is much better when it's giving recommendations rather than mandates. And that's likely what will happen if there are cases that that uh, rise. And remember, we also have to recognize that we do have tools like Paxlovid and vaccines and boosters and monoclonal antibodies. And so long as hospitals aren't seeing pressure on their capacity, there's not going to be that same push as there once was for, for mask mandates. So recommendations, yes, probably will, will occur if there's high levels in certain areas, but I don't think mandates will return in the United States. Okay, Amish Shadalja, I will have to give you the final word. Unfortunately, we're completely out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank Dr. Margaret Harris and Dr. Ed Kelly as well for joining us and uh, our viewers, of course, for being with us. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.